Hey, James. Hey, how's it going, young man? All right. It's going good. It's going good. Yep. Uh, so we had, <laughs> you had a, uh, a Fed or a fag try to uh, pull a fast one on you. Oh, uh, wow. That, some, somebody told me that just posted uh, in November, like the first week of November, my eye blew up really bad when I went to my email box. You know, after not doing emails for a couple of months, uh, and I found out that kind of like the fonts and type size and everything with the emails was, you know, kind of an irritant with my eyes. So I I just forwarded these emails to editor Lynn, and she converted them into usable documents for me because I also don't know how to get the formatting out of them. You know, like if I copy and paste an email, I can't figure out how to get the you know, the junk out of there, whatever, I'm, I'm retarded. But uh, she sends me this thousand word screed of this guy that starts out as, you know, all right, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, student of recently summarized history. Uh, and he's discussing Tolkien and some interesting things. And I end up having to break it in three pieces. And by the end of the second part, He's repeatedly engaged in worship of African Americans that were, you know, just that people from Europe cannot in any way compete physically with such folks. And it's unfair that we should have to occupy the same space as them because they're they're essentially unbeatable supermen. And uh, we call them Negroes on this show, James. Right. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. He, uh, <laughs> And then he goes on to start talking about, you know, how people are going to have to take up arms and take genocidal action against, you know, it was it it was obviously uh, it just an attempt to uh, uh, to lure me into a rational conversation and uh, and put something on my site that would make it look like, you know, I was some kind of white supremacist or something. He's one of the. I had already decided that I wasn't going to do any more like answering emails unless I knew for a fact that the guy bought books from me. I won't even answer an email. You know, uh, I just decided to save my eyes that. And then uh, I, I just I just had to uh, I was pretty unprofessional. And I actually at some point wrote, you know, just get it over with and you know, <laughs> put on the put on the dress, get on your knees in an alley in Chicago and. You know, pray to the ebony god you know i mean yeah. it's uh so it was kind of unfortunate that i wrote it but uh well i did and uh you know <laughs> it's, all it's all good yeah i just can't uh it's the one thing that kind of always yeah you know i actually had real you know like real old school uh negro haters tried to kill me for treating oh. black people like human beings okay I mean, I remember what a guy that hated black people back in the 70s and 80s was like, okay? But now, since there's, and I think it's probably all gay. I think the alt-right movement's probably fundamentally gay. If you look at it, I don't know, but you're probably going to find out that a lot of the leaders and organizers are homos. Because the whole tone, and I remember this from a Richard Spencer podcast with some guy that use, uses the pen name of Charles Bronson's uh, vigilante character in the Death Wish movies, Paul Kersey, where they were oh. talking about how, you know, white men shouldn't watch football because white men can't compete in football with black men and just blah, blah, blah. You know, we're just like these intellectual managerial machines. So I'm not seeing anything from your most, uh, you know, African hating white nationalists in the United States that I haven't seen my whole life from liberal progressive uh, whites in my life, you know. So uh, I just feel like, uh, you know, it's it's all worship. You know, people confuse the, uh, the based on our residual Christianity in this culture. We think that worship is only love and adoration of a beneficent creator or or a, a savior, but worship. Uh, throughout most of history and in most religions has also included a deep fear and dread of the God that you're worshiping. 
you know, American liberals, which includes white nationalists, because to me they're liberals, um, they're, they worship, whether they hate them or love them, you know, they worship black men in this country every bit as much as an Aztec priest worshipped uh, Hoots the Potal when he laid hearts on the altar. Okay. That's my opinion, anyhow. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you, and I mean... Um... May, I don't know, maybe some people say it doesn't count, but I mean, I, I think one of the greatest fighters of all time in modern history, and maybe all time, is um, is a Slavic European, you know, white, uh, Fedor Emelianko. Um, and he's, he beat up many, or beat up at least one, I don't, I, I don't know about many, but he beat up at least one black guy. So. <laughs> oh, black men are almost extinct in professional boxing. Right. If you look at the 17 white classes, they dominate like three of them. Uh, you know, uh, and it's just the point is, is who boxed and who fought is generally about who was temporarily at the bottom of the economic zone. Right. You know, there was 20 years when your best boxers were Jewish in this country. You know, so it's you know, there was a period when it was English, when it was Irish, when it was Italian, when it was African. And, and now your best boxers are guys that come from former Soviet republics. Latin America and Asia. Yeah, right. you know, so it's just uh it's more of a class know. thing. Yeah, when it comes to fighting, everybody can fight. It's just that, you know, certain fight sports give certain body types advantages and disadvantages and you know, uh that's you know, this weird perversion when I was growing up that I mean, I was told that I would never be able to box because of the color of my skin and that, I, that naturally made me an inferior combatant. You know, when, when I was a, when I was a young man. So I, I can when, when people start saying the same thing to me, some young guy today that wants to start a race war in this country is telling me that African-Americans are invincible warriors. That's the same thing. My mother, my uncle, my friends, uh, my doctor, the pediatrician, Dr. Young, told me when I was 12 years old, 11 years old, when I wanted to become a boxer, that I could never box because you know, I had this crappy freckle skin with pim pimples, you know, that burned in the sun, you know, made me a poor fighter. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm necessarily going to be fighting in the Vegas sun. I think most boxing matches are held indoors. That should be OK. <laughs> right. Oh. Don't, I read some. OK, I'm kind of pulling this out of my bad memory here. Um, but I remember reading somewhere like uh, black babies has smaller skulls than white babies and so like when you if if you have like a white father and a black mother it can be kind of dangerous uh for the black woman because her vagina isn't like can't can't always accommodate like the the big head um now i don't know if that's just like do do mixed race african americans because i mean a lot of them have white blood in them too um or european blood do they just produce a bigger skull or do do um uh, Europeans have bigger skulls because um, I mean that relates to boxing, right? I mean, yeah. a bigger skull. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Okay, so well, I don't know anything about this genetic stuff. Uh, well, my experience with fighters in boxing and other sports is that the darker skin the African American is, the rounder and bigger his head is. You can you can measure how big somebody's head is by how far apart their eyes are. And uh, the people overall with the biggest heads are actually African-American women. And most all of these people came from West Africa in the United States. Uh, it, when I was younger, the average black person had 25 percent European. Now, when I look at when I look around, uh, I, I'd, you're probably lucky to see 30 percent like the young black guys now. That I see, like the one black kids that I saw with the white mother. There, there was a, a, white, a big white skinned black man I took the bus with yesterday, and he was mated with a large red headed woman. And they had a child that was, wow, he was like dad was six shades darker than mom, even though he was light skinned. And this kid was only like one shade darker than mom. Okay. okay. So, it's but the point is, it doesn't uh, I haven't found a significant difference in the combat ability of people based on their race. You just have to train them different if they have a different body type. Now, right. there is a there are 
market disadvantages uh, to being a person of a certain race in more special, more specific sports. You know, in fighting, you can win by being quick or by being strong. So in strength sports, that excludes most of at the top level. It excludes most of the people that are not northern or eastern Europeans, period. Nobody else can even get into it. All right. But with fighting, depending on the rule set, this admits everybody. Uh, you just have to train people differently. Now, as far as uh, the uh, the toughest skulls are Polish skulls. I know that from experience because they tend to be almost square. They really hurt your hands when you hit them, but they cut easy. Uh, now, the as far as stick fighting, we use fencing masks. We've had problems with men, including a big Nordic man and a medium-sized black man who's very very dark and probably 95% African, they both have a hard time wearing fencing masks and not getting concussions or skull fractures because the fencing mask is designed for this angular, gracile, high cast European skull. It's not designed for your round headed Alpine, you know, descendant as a Neanderthals or a West African with a round head, you know. So even in even in pure African populations, you'll see some some African races will have very narrow, gracile skulls, and then some African races will have very rounded, uh, robust skulls. You know, depending on what part of the country they're from. You know, so it's our whole idea of race is just so ridiculous. Like, you know, the idea that there's even a white race or a black race is just retarded. Uh, so. Well, E. Michael Jones, he did a he's talked a lot about that, like. The whole concept of whiteness was, according to him, um, it was an invention by the slave traders, slave masters of the Anglo elite. Wow, he must have got that that from me. <laughs> okay, I was the first one to posit that. Well, I'm glad to know that such a uh, such a brilliant man is amongst my readers. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. you're supposed to be copied. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that, that, it's. There is no use of white as a racial noun before 1600 that I've been able to trace. And the dean of this subject, the man who wrote White Over Black, a history of these two races, he starts his history when the idea of the white race begins, which is around 1600, which is exactly when the Dutch slave traders locked down the Caribbean slave trade. And most of that slave trade was trafficking Scottish and Irish rebels into Barbados and Jamaica. And then it ended up also including shipping Africans in there as well. And uh, the term white was a way that a non-Christian European who looked like his 10 men on his crew could make common calls with his Christian crew, which would be about 10 men. And then you got one to 400 slaves of various races underneath deck, okay? Some of whom might be Christian some of whom might be heathen or might even be Muslim, you know, so uh, the, you know, it's, I think it was just a term that was defensive in nature that non-Christian Europeans would use to seek protection from their fellow slave traders who were Christian Europeans from Christian European slaves and from heathen and Islamic African slaves when there was an uprising because these crews were very small. If those people below decks got a free hand, you know, you're looking at 20 to 1 odds. Right. It's, it's really bad news. And half of your crew are unfree men themselves who might even have been brought from below decks to replace a, a crew member who fell overboard or got his head smashed by a, uh, by a pulley or block. Okay, So it, it's uh, our idea of race is a macrozoological invention of the 1600s that doesn't gain traction until the 1700s and is primarily economic. Uh, in the English language, the use of the term white as a racial noun does not begin to be used until the late 1600s and doesn't gain any type of general currency until the 1730s. Now, what happened in America between 1680 in 1740, what happened is almost all of the Africans that were ever brought to America were brought in that window. 
in response to European slaves rising up and rebelling against the European slave masters. Um, so it's no accident that the term white and the, and the term black begin to be used in America during this window of time when people are being brought in by Africa, but from Africa, and it doesn't gain general currency until the revolution of the 1770s. And the term white instead of Christian does not gain currency until the 1820s and doesn't become the dominant term until the 1870s. Well, in the 1820s, America is finally totally independent. It won the second round of combat against England, against Britain. And and in fact, the term white used by Europeans is very much like the English empire switching to use the term Britain when a large portion of their military began to be made up of Scottish, Welsh, Irish, and Cornish men who weren't English. So they switched to British as a blanket identity, even though they still practiced an English over Gaelic tyranny in their society. Uh, So even the the term white has a more, or the term black has a more ancient uh, 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 semantic origin, but doesn't come into use as a racial, uh, as a common racial term until uh, the mid 1600s. Again, about the same period, the mid 1600s, uh, uh, you know, was a period when to have an African slave was uh, a demonstration of of very high wealth and status because they were so expensive because y- you had to get these people from a whole other continent, from a different hemisphere or, you know, so from below the equator. So it's and it's not until after this American Civil War that the term white and black become the dominant term. Uh, for describing these very large and heterogeneous groupings of people that are artificially grouped as some kind of comic book race. Okay. Um, something that's a little related, and I, I think it also has to do with like economics and um, like justifying economic tyranny over others is like um, social, social Darwinism. Um, I don't know exactly the years that it, that came out in history, but like uh, I remember reading a little bit and listening to some talks about um, Darwin's other book, uh, The Descent of Man or something like that. And he has like a picture of like an African on one side and then a, an Irishman in the middle and then an Englishman. <laughs> and he's like, com- he's comparing noses. Maybe you've seen this. I don't know. Uh, yeah, the, the phenotype illustrations are comically funny. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, phreneology, the study of the shape of the human face and head was this really big thing in the second half of the 1800s. And actually, Bram Stoker was one of the students of this. Of this, It was really a science. Uh, and I, I think it was blown way out of proportion. Uh, some people uh, s- still believe in it, but Bram Stoker was inherent to it. One of my favorite other authors, uh, Sir Captain Richard Francis Burton, was a phrenologist. He was very proud of his pseudo-gypsy head. <laughs> And he, he thought of Irishmen as just a completely debased subhumans. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah, it just, um, it, it's an interesting thing how the elites will use their sophistry uh, to just justify, like, oppression of one class over, an, uh, one group over another. And, the, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I wanted to ask you. For power. Right, power, yeah. I want to ask you a, qu- a question now. Um, I think w- I don't know if I heard this from you or not, but like I'm, I think I did though. Uh, African <clears throat> African Americans, right? So they're they're mixed um, racially, and uh, they have higher levels of testosterone. Well, um, I used to. <laughs> okay. It's not what I'm seeing well, in the general population now. Well, the generation coming up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Gotcha. But yeah, then. The number that I got from a study in the late 90s was 17 uh, percent. But testosterone is so fungible. It's so it's so related to behavior. Uh, you know, the Marine U.S. Marine Corps proved that they could take most men and crash their testosterone down to critical levels and from an average testosterone rate and then raise it up to the stratosphere just through behavior and activity. Uh, so 
I'm, I'm really suspicious of like, you know, the genetic and racial determinism. Uh, it, you know, you can, uh, a, a single person can have greatly fluctuating testosterone throughout his life between 200 and 900 on the scale. And I don't even know what those numbers mean. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a fact that, that uh, black women definitely have much higher testosterone <laughs> than, uh, uh, than European women. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> that's undisputable. <laughs> I was getting examined by two of them yesterday, uh, which was just hilarious. You know, the the girl examining my testicles looked like Candace Owens with a bikini bod. I mean, oh, really, yes. really attractive young lady. And so she's got to bring in a witness because of the medical company. And she brings in a standard, you know, 40-year-old, uh, you know, medical tech uh, lady. Uh, they're, they're, they're both ladies of color. And I look at the lady standing by the door and who's observing me being fondled. And I said, thank you so much for protecting me. You know, because <laughs> of course, I was a living Hennessy billboard. I mean, and she's looking at me and and laughing and like, you know, basically, basically acknowledging like, yeah, I'm sorry for interrupting your fantasy here. You know, but, uh, <laughs> you got the sister, you know, literally like, you know, on her haunches in front of you with her face in your junk doing an examination. <laughs> So, so it was. Uh, oh, that's you know, funny. I mean, suffice it to say that almost everything that uh, that that uh, the people that believe themselves to be white Americans think they know about African Americans is wrong. Uh, you know, and, and I, I've grown wary of even explaining it to people. I just think they should all screw up and then and then get in trouble. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm sick of uh, you know trying to uh, warn people against uh, miscalculations, uh, you know, concerning the people that they worship out either out of uh, uh, fear or guilt. Right. One's right. just as the other, as far as I'm concerned. Well, how do you, um, how do you get these, uh, these Bantus to submit? I would love, I, I would love to talk about that more in any recent uh, submissions you've had from these people. <laughs> In Baltimore. No, it was uh, in Portland when I was writing that in November. Right. You know, and these was, are criminals, too. These are like asshole criminals. Well, so the, they deserve to be to be on their knees. Well, this guy was people. it was a guy that was uh, kind of like strongly demanding that some some guilty ghosts give him some money. And he had his little girl out there who was like a mixed girl. And I was like, oh, I, I might have some trouble with this guy. And I'm walking past him. You know, he's half my age. He's got 80 pounds on me. He looks pretty fit. He's the street person. But he, he dresses himself well. He keeps himself clean. And we end up making eye contact. And he says, good morning, sir. How are you today? I said, fine. Hope you have a nice day. And then he walked by me with his girl. And then he stopped. And he said, sir. And I stopped and I looked at him. He said, magnificent beard. Oh, nice, okay. nice. Uh, you know, I, okay, so this is a guy that's shaken down other other people that might have the same skin tone as me, but they don't look a whole lot like me in other ways, okay, because they're younger, taller, better looking, you know, they don't look like they just curled out of a cave. But, uh, you know, this has been my whole life in Baltimore. Well, I had two black men about my age, one a couple years younger, one 10 years older, befriended me at bus stops yesterday because they've both been getting attacked by young black men, you know, and yeah. they helped me. I helped the one guy out. He was basically lost. The older guy that helped me out because I was standing at the wrong bus stop. He called me over. He's like, hey, hey, sir, get down here, you know, and then I thanked him. His name's Jerome. He said, people call me Jr. And he asked me if I was from Baltimore. And, uh, you know, so I told him, you know, briefly that I had to leave because I couldn't defend myself anymore. I was getting attacked by too many young groups of young men going to work. So I've been out of state. I was coming back from medical treatment. And uh, and he just went off and he started talking about how often he's attacked by groups of these young men. And this is a 69 year old guy that is still successfully fighting off pairs and trios of men in their teens and 20s. What's that tell you about how wimpy these guys are? Okay. Right. And yet and yet I'm at the Chicago Union Station and I see heavyweight men 
in their late twenties, traveling businessmen, uh, you know, being harassed by skinny sixty to seventy year old homeless black men for money because these homeless black men know that these guys are going to cough up the money and they don't want any trouble. They walk right by me and how you doing, sir? I'm doing okay. You know, I mean, they they know where the guilt is and they know where the fear is. You know, so you see a. a you see this uh, standard American who's Caucasian, who's 6'4", 270 pounds, looks like he was in, probably in really good shape before COVID, but picked up 50 pounds. Because you see the 50 pounds of COVID weight all across the country now. And a dude that's like twice his age and only 180 pounds shakes him down for $5 in public. What would those guys... threatening them. He's just shaming them. If, if, yeah. Do you think those... Um the Bantus would actually do any violence. No, no, he's people. just shaming them. This is pure yeah. guilt. This right. is, there's a thousand people in the station. There's like armed security. There's three types of cops. Okay. This is just pure guilt. Okay. Uh, but the guilt and the fear rotate in the Caucasian American brain. Okay. And uh, one, somebody that has one probably has the other. They probably have both of them. Okay. Uh, some of them just have the fear and then it turns to hate when they're told to feel the guilt. Because they don't want to go back to the guilt, all right? But uh, you know, um, this was not a racial thing. This was an age thing with me and Jr. and Curtis. We're three, yeah. you know, we're not big. We're all under six feet tall. We're all under two hundred pounds. I think Jr. could have probably beat the shit out of Curtis and me combined at the same time. Okay, even though he was seventy, all right. Uh, but this was an age thing. We're protecting ourselves against packs of young men. You know, and of course, we don't have to say what color they are. And we know what color they're going to be. <laughs> OK. Right. You know, because that's the case. But you're I mean, the biggest danger with these guys is that they're going to die on you. They're very fragile. They're guys <laughs> that, you know, they were malnourished and mistreated as children. They've been smoking cigarettes since they were nine years old Been drinking booze and smoking weed since they were 10 years old. A half of them have been sodomized, uh, you know before they hit puberty and they're not robust fighting machines. They're psychologically very weak and physically tend to be not very rugged specimens. You know, the, uh, because our masculine body image is based on gay bodybuilding. We look <laughs> at a guy that has thin skin and high definition as some kind of an invincible Superman. When you know, if you've been in combat sport, that's the first guy to get hurt. The yeah. guy you want to be afraid of is that guy that's got the one inch of glazed donut over top of his muscles and you can't see his veins and his muscle striations. He's got some padding. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's how Fedor Emilianko looks. He's, he's, yeah, yeah. Got I mean, that's just, and, and see, all these fighters know this. And you know what? This conversation is going to insult, you know, most of the white guys that are hearing it. Okay. And it's going to insult all the black guys that are hearing it who weren't boxers, okay? Because this is the kind of conversation that boxers of various races will have with each other all the time in the gym. Oh, you have really long arms for a white guy. Way to go, Mr. Jim, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's like, bro, you know, you got a pretty narrow head for a black guy. You you, know, you better work when you're slipping and bobbing and weaving, you know? You don't have a head like a bucket. <laughs> no, I mean, so, you know, but it's not the kind of conversation that you can have in non-physical civil company. Yeah, no, I because civility in our society is based upon non-physicality. Um, do you do you want to go on to uh, disease? Sure, whatever you'd like to talk about. Bro. Yeah. Creatively, I'm on the lag today. I actually had a four-article morning, so uh, you know, you, you decide what we're talking about. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, well, I think before we, when we said we were going to talk about disease, like a couple of, like a month ago when we discussed it more in depth, we were going to do like disease and um, the we, new, the new priestly class system. Right. So we did revolution and that led to genocide and heroism. Yeah. And then of course all that leads, you know, where very often revolutions and genocides are uh, combined uh, with disease problems. Uh, so. Right. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to like, um, and heroism talk, too, by the way. Okay. Right. I wanted to talk maybe like a little bit about the um, the circumcision, the male genital mutilation thing, because that, that's kind of I, I think it's kind of interesting. It kind of plays into 
a little it dips in both spheres of like the priestly class uh-huh. and and supposed disease um so yeah i was just gonna give my two cents <laughs> but this will definitely sure. right. this will definitely make people hate me <laughs> so on both sides <laughs> but yeah i mean uh where do i begin well i was thinking we could just go back to the 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 chosen people like moses maimonides i haven't read the entire book of his book the guide for the perplexed and um but i was reading quotes from him in a book talking generally about circumcision um i believe writ- written by a chosen person <laughs> so moses maimonides um he talks about how like the purpose well he was a doctor too a medieval physician at the t- uh, in the middle ages and he was like there are no um physical benefits uh for circumcision uh because we number one we know like the uses of the foreskin we know that it's very benef- like the it's very useful it's not like a useless piece of skin and then like two um <clears throat> he was like that would be like an insult to the to the creator to say like he created something um useless right and then he was like he goes and he talks about the the sages and it was like um saying how they say the real purpose was to um reduce uh like take away someone's sexual sensitivity so they would like you know l- lust less and things like that and um the point the point being is it was to just it was to damage the the kid right his his sex organ i though then was listening well, okay before i go into that i'll say also thomas aquinas and i believe augustine but i'm not positive about augustine but i know thomas aquinas also says that like um circumcision was <clears throat> had many reasons one was like to be a sign or a symbol of like the future um seed or something of jesus christ uh, um, but then also it was to reduce um he says concupiscence or lust um but uh what it oh so <laughs> this ties going the i personally think though that yeah it is it, de- it definitely damages you severe severely um doesn't eliminate it for everybody the sexual pleasure or but it, d- it definitely damages you but i i think there's so that that is a main reason but the, there's another reason or many reasons i think one of the main reasons is submission it's a submission ritual by for the primarily for the parents to the priest and that that's kind of i i think that's what it is like because um and i first got this idea from this um russian general um he was doing talks and stuff and he was going he talked a lot about circumcision a lot about like lots of things but um he was saying how it like messes up the brain the psychology the pair bonding between the kid and the and the parents and blah 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 and just messes up the hard wire but he says it's also like a submission ritual the parents are submitting to that to those um those priests <clears throat> and then we i i think it just shows like it carries over to the modern world um parents are submitting to these ridiculous ideas of like it's healthier or just whatever whatever is the new bullshit right uh that the the doctor says and then they're you know letting the doctor do this and um i also think it's kind of like a substitute for like this might be far-fetched but this is just a hypothesis but i think it might be a substitute for like um child sacrifice you know like you know they used to like sacrifice the kids and stuff firstborn or whatever um that might be far-fetched i don't know um but yeah so <clears throat> this all plays into the priestly class disease thing because i mean most diseases in my opinion um like brovid and all of this stuff are just are just bullshit they're just there to harvest from the cattle like like you've said right they're just harvest from us and I, I think this is a good example. And then also, it's, like I said, it's a submission ritual. Um, and uh, it also kind of like it, it, they also do this thing, too, um, where 
they'll talk about how like male circumcision is like no big deal. It's not genital mutilation, but female circumcision is like the worst thing in the world. And it is bad. It is bad. Um, and <clears throat> I think it really puts people in like this weird dichotomy. I've definitely fallen into this where like you start arguing over and trying to fight over like who's the bigger victim, you know, like the woman or the man. And then like that, that just like, like, because like, you know, victimhood is the only hero in our society. And it took me a while to like figure, figure that one out. Um, instead of like, kind of like how, uh, when it comes to the, the Europeans versus the African slaves, just kind of saying, Hey, you know what? We're not going to, let's not argue about who's the bigger victim. We both were fucked seriously. You know, and like, let's find some solidarity. But there's this psyop where they they divide us, divide and conquer us. I think the same thing goes with the genders here on this one, because I've seen a lot of like, I've wasted a lot of time on this subject online, <laughs> like argue with people, argue with women, bullshit, try to convince people of my ideas and stuff like. And it's just like, um, it's I think it's somewhat of a psyop just to get us to fight over like men and women and stuff, who's the bigger victim and female or male circumcision and <clears throat> and uh i've done a little bit of research i mean there was this one woman hanny klein lightfoot she went to africa and she did she's against all forms of circumcision but she did a shitload of study studies something like 500 african women that have had their m most of their clitoris removed um uh still exp like still experience orgasms and it's actually their percentage, the percentage of women that have, from this study, okay, just from this study, um, that experience orgasm is higher than some of the studies of uh, the females that in, in the West that have an intact clitoris. These women that have their clitoris removed sometimes, like, uh, they experience orgasm a little bit more when you compare these two studies, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I, I, I don't... I just I'm saying these things, interesting facts, but I once again I'm not trying to say like who's the fucking bigger victim, because um, I don't think that's really useful. Um, it's just that we're both getting fucked, right? <laughs> so, um, and then kind of moving on from that, I just some other things like you know false diseases by the priestly class. You got the fucking wisdom teeth extraction, which I think is like one of the biggest psyops out there. Like they've convinced people. That four molars, completely healthy molars, are 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 like bad, and and you pay them a lot of money to like take these t teeth out, and they don't have any cavities. And it, like the little research I've done is that like even if your molars are your wisdom teeth are impacted, rarely, rarely does that ever even cause any problems. You know, like impacted wisdom teeth and stuff. Yeah, you're gonna experience pain. But like all teeth that come in, you know, like you experience pain, right? So, and um, you know, like the, the there's other shit too, like uh, the what is it called? Um, they used to cut that thing out, uh, tonsils. I don't know much about that topic, but it does. It just um, I'm trying to think of other examples, but yeah, the the priestly class they like they they will demonize or make certain body parts on the cattle to be they'll convince the cattle that like this has a disease or something you know and, and i think it also kind of ties into um social darwinism and and Dar and evolution because i forget the technical term but there's a term within evolution where like a body part e uh, evolves uselessly like there's a useless body part and i i personally don't believe in that concept i i mean i think it's kind of like fallacious that like even if you say, well, we don't know what this body part's use is, therefore it's useless. That's like, ar that's arguing from ignorance, right? It's a fallacy. And they kind of, they, they just like use these, these things to like cheat us, you know? <laughs> but uh, that's my rant. I can't think of anything else to add. So I, yeah, I would be interested uh, in hearing your thoughts. Well, I mean, it's a real small subject as far as I'm concerned, because it's only one member big. I mean, beyond my penis, I don't care about any other penis on the planet. You know, uh, so, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, the uh, you know, so I could care less, you know, who's doing this to who. It's none of my business. But um, Joseph Campbell was of the opinion that the root uh, of circumcision was probably a way for the same as scarification amongst primitive tribes where 
but more specific, where the girl, when she becomes a woman, she starts to bleed. So circumcision would be a way to mimic that, at least circumcision in the man. It's obvious that circumcision in a woman is done to reduce, uh, you know, uh, sexual desire, you know, for whatever reason. It's very often the, the aunties to get together and do it to the little girl when she's coming of age. You know, so, but I don't really, uh, you know, I don't really care about female circumcision either. I, uh, uh, I'm not going to let anybody forcibly circumcise, you know, uh, you know, any of my girlfriends. You know, so, uh, so I don't see it, I don't see it being an issue. I I could care less, you know. I mean, uh, apparent in 2019, all the liberal women and all the conservative women I knew thought that the war in Afghanistan was a good idea because our guys were over there dying, so that women on the other side of the world didn't have to wear a mask. And then a year later, all these women are wearing masks here. <laughs> okay, yeah, you know. So I really. I don't really care, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, what's happening in other people's bodies. But I do think that, you know, our uh, our priestly class, their currency is uh, ultimately comes down to money. They'll use social control uh, for for that purpose. But ultimately, they're getting a mansion built in pool and a yacht. So any surgery that's not necessary that could maybe cause another problem down the line that would need more medical care it's going to make more money so why not do it right you know breast implants might need to be redone every 10 years you know uh th- that's it you're uh, if you if you have a problem uh caused by one of these things they'll also have the solution and i'd like to uh remind that a doctor is the person in charge of indoctrination it's the same it's the root for the word doctrine and doctrinaire has more to do with ideology than anything and that medical doctors uh you know are only called doctors predominantly recently you know over the past couple hundred years it would have been a physician or a healer before that or a leech so this uh, (laughs) this idea that the person that the doctor you know that it, it, it makes sense that the original term for the person that you know sets out the doctrine and educates people to follow the doctrine and promulgates the doctrine that eventually that term would get uh placed upon the physician and then the physician when he's been called nothing but a doctor for a century or two is now all of a sudden at the epicenter of the great medical cult because we're mostly atheists and agnostics, and we worship our, our body, you know, as like this tragically dying temple that we're trying to keep alive like a Mayflower. Uh, so I think it all makes sense, and it, it probably all works for the good of social control. And that's ultimately what, you know, people on the left and right all care about. They just, they're all obsessed with social control. They just want to be the ones deciding who's going to be controlled and in what context they're going to be controlled. Right. You know, you know, Just about every American other than me can agree that so high levels of social control in a police state are a good thing. I mean, white nationalists want a police state to, uh, you know, to basically keep most black men in prison, and liberal progressives want a police state, you know, to keep, you know, men of European descent out of the workforce and out of politics and and demonized. You know, so everybody wants a police state. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it's fucked up on both sides. Like going back to the the circumcision thing, right? So like you have these pro these uh, people that are against circumcision, right? But who are these people that are really adamantly not all of them, but uh, there's a faction of these people that are adamantly opposed to circumcision. It's homosexuals, right? And we like we don't have to think that hard why they're obsessed with babies penises right so um both sides yeah they're 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 pretty fucked up um and you and then you have the conservatives that like want to maintain the tradition and and you know respect religious values and and blah 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 and yeah so you know uh you know if as long as the thing still works and you're you're displeased with a circumcision that your parents decided for you to get you know back in the day you can fix it you know, I did. You know, it didn't take me that long. Uh, I had no idea you could do such a thing, but... Uh, 
Oh yeah, I've, a young a young a white friend should. of mine uh, took care of it. You know, you know. So oh. it's uh, and the people that uh, you know, I think the people that if they possibly did it to reduce male sexual promiscu- promiscuity, I think maybe they had a point because you know, with me being circumcised and having gotten older. And, you know, your skin all over your body thins out when you get older. I was starting to, you know, I would limit my sexual activity to like once a week, you know, just because, you know, uh, uh, you know, skin problems. So uh, a a young lady uh, wanted to sample the patriarchy and (laughs) my iteration. And I was like, you know, I don't feel that good about this. And she asked me and I, I told her, I said, you know, my skin's getting thin and you're a long lady, you're going to want a very vigorous experience and everything. And, you know, I'm sure it's going to feel great, but then I'm going to be putting salve on this damn thing for the rest of the week, you know. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's not worth it to me. So she said, I can fix it for you. And she did, you know. Uh, so so now, uh, you know, I'm good to go twice a day, every day of the week, you know. So I think maybe uh, – the old prudes that didn't want guys uh, having a lot of sex, maybe they were right because, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I I operate better at 60 than I did at 50. Are you, well, are you saying she restored your foreskin? Yeah. Oh, oh, that's pretty damn. Was it through like, because I've looked into this stuff. Is uh, it? I'm not, I'm not going to get into any details. I'm not, I'm not that much <laughs> of a, uh, of an open book, but uh, if, uh, how long did it take you? Though? Young men in the Bay Area run into an off the boat Korean prostitute who <laughs> wants to have freebie sex with an old Caucasian patriarch behind the back of her pimp. Okay, then maybe she'll be able to help you restore your foreskin. You know, maybe it's a service these girls are used to providing for uh, Franklos. Okay. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So say say took care of me. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, you know, and uh, she well knew I was going to be using it on other women, too. But she was like, you know, uh, that's all right. She, uh, you know, she she did the work for the whole team. OK, team player. OK, nice. Uh, um, and I have an idea for a shirt if anybody wants to make it. Uh, I was sparring with the husband of a liberal progressive who, on Sunday and before I beat up her husband and his friend in front of her and her daughter for an hour and a half, uh, she said, I, I put our daughter in a shirt just for you because she knows I'm a misogynist, right? Although she likes me, you know, and uh, it had a flower pot in the middle of the shirt and framed around it. It said trample the patriarchy. <laughs> so I got an idea. I said, OK, you gave me an idea for a shirt for me to wear. How about sample the patriarchy <laughs> and it could be like a a frank frazetta version of a hennessy billboard you know where you got the brother with like a chick on each arm yeah what i would do is i would take four decommissioned uh supermarket characters i would take hungry jack the redneck with the suspenders and overalls that used to be on the 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 hungry jack pancake mix box okay and wearing a wife beater Put him in a wife beater now, okay? And then on his right ankle, you have the blue bonnet girl, the blonde, hugging his leg. And on his left ankle, you'll have the Land O'Lakes butter babe. And massaging his shoulders, smiling over top of his shoulder, will be Aunt Jemima, okay? And we'll just title it. So that's a meme somebody could make up and sample the patriarchy. It's got, like, grocery food ads in there and everything, and it's misogynistic, and it's patriarchal. I think somebody ought to do it. And I don't need any money for it. OK, I'm just throwing the idea out there for you T-shirt manufacturers amongst the teeming millions uh, listening to this broadcast. Okay? Nice. Nice. I, great idea. Actually, I'll call up my uh, contacts in the Middle Kingdom and we'll get the slaves making it. ASAP. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe there's like a little sushi girl you could throw in there. So we get like the around the world experience. But, you know. You know, maybe oh. like a, a cute little Jap girl with chopsticks or something like that off of some label that, you know, could maybe be thrown on his other arm. I don't know. You know, <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Um, do you do you want to talk more about like historical diseases? Um, uh, sure. Well, we could start with the 
Well, I, the first one that comes to mind is the, the the Black Death or the Plague. But if you know of any that are earlier, well, there's uh, one referenced in the Iliad during okay. the Siege of Troy, and uh, this was believed to be an affliction sent by Apollo because the Achaeans under uh, uh, Agamemnon and Achilles and Menelaus were attacking the city of Troy, Ilium, which was supposed to have been built built by two gods, Poseidon and Apollo. Who, and Apollo was the god of arts. He was the urban god. He was also the god of disease, uh, which, you know, that kind of makes sense if you think about it, where disease is going to break out around cities. Poseidon was the god of the sea, and Troy was a city that controlled the seaway between the Black Sea and the Wine Dark Sea. So uh, that plague that would commonly hit probably dysentery, that, uh, or dysentery, cholera, typhus. There were three things that would tend to hit besieging armies or the besieged. Uh, that was thought to have been sent by Apollo, who was also the far darter. They imagine him being an archer that shot arrows of disease. He was also the god of the sun. Uh, and, he was a, and he was not the top guy. He was regarded as only uh, one eleventh of the 11 deities that held 49% of the corporate Olympian power, with Zeus holding 51%. So uh, there's also uh, were obvious uh, indications of disease during the Bronze Age collapse. A lot of these migratory invasions, which the legend of Troy is probably a model version of migratory invasion. And of course, the travels of Jason and the Argonaut and of Odysseus were really metaphoric uh, retellings of migrations, as was the Aeneid and the migration of Aeneas and the surviving Trojans away from burning Troy and eventually founding Rome. So uh, migration and disease go together a lot with, with the collapse of civilization. And these also tend to spark the ages of heroes, because once people start wandering around in small groups, in ships, uh, they really want heroic figures leading them. And uh, in the Roman period, in the uh, late 200s, from about 250 to 300, uh, when the Roman Empire collapsed, uh, this was accompanied by plague. And then in, I think, 512 or 520, uh, when the Roman Empire that rebooted as what we call the first iteration of the Byzantine Empire that also collapsed under plague pressure. And again, these plagues were accompanied by migrations of tribal people out of the hinterlands, which were caused ultimately by climactic shifts to a lower temperature and greater precipitation. So they're tied in and the Black Death as well. The Black Death uh, came in uh, its first mark around the Battle of Grecy in 1336, and it plagues the entire Hundred Years' War, which goes until like 1425, I think. Agincourt, that battle was, I think, in 1415, and that was still plague time. Now, the, uh, the Black Death, the bubonic plague, comes into Europe uh, right as the Little Ice Age starts in uh, 1315. When, ironically, the Templars are disbanded and wiped out, a year after the Templars are wiped out in 1314, in 1315, a six-year deluge starts. Constant rain across Europe for six years destroys the grain crop. You have malnutrition. There's also all this precip causes cooler temperatures in the hinterlands. So you get a renewed Tartar presence reinvading you know eastern europe and you have uh, apparently a siege on the black sea uh, uh, where people from asia uh, are besieging uh, this place uh, develops the bubonic plague and then the bubonic plague is carried from genoese and venetian merchant ships to italy and it spreads all over europe that way uh, within two years uh, by uh, i think uh it takes two years to cover most of Europe, but I believe Iceland doesn't really get whacked by it until like 1370. Now, the plague, uh, a good treatment of this is uh, a doctor who wrote a book in 74 called Plagues and Peoples. Okay. 
And it looks like the bubonic plague originally uh, started in Ethiopia and India and then ends up traveling to Asia, to Northeast Asia in Manchuria and goes to ground in an inactive uh, state amongst uh, uh, ground burrowing rodents. In fact, this this plague is still carried by prairie dogs in the western United States. There is a theory that the prairie dog plague, bubonic plague, uh, is left over from the plague that wiped out the Cahokia civilization in 1400 when people carrying the bubonic plague from Greenland and Iceland moved into the Great Lakes region and intermarried with the native tribes because uh, there's there's no clear indication that Chinese coolies in the late 1800s brought it into the uh, into the Western United States. And also, it seems like uh, the plague is uh, indigenous to the prairie dog population and uh, and was there longer than the early 1800s. So it's a theory. It's not proven. Uh, the, the fact is medical historians. Do, are not sure of the ultimate source and the spread of the bubonic plague, but it spreads with urbanization, war, like all plagues are spread by urbanization and war. Good communication systems encourage the spread of the plague. This is why the Romans were taken down twice by the plague. The Incas would be taken down by smallpox on their road systems. And there has never been a better communication system than the, than the horse post system that was used by the Mongols, who were the people that spread the bubonic plague from Manchuria uh, all the way over uh, to the Black Sea. And the last outbreak, serious outbreak of the bubonic plague in Europe was in London in 1666, the year that George Alsop uh, returned from the plantations uh, and wrote his poem. And it is documented by Daniel Defoe in a book titled uh, The Plague Year. And it's a very good uh, indication of how the servant class was abandoned by their wealthy masters and left to die of the plague in the city when their wealthy masters went to the countryside to ride out the plague because everybody knows that the plague doesn't do that well in the countryside. It does well in the city in congested circumstances. Well, that's kind of, okay. So that... That brings me to like a question I want to ask you. Um, how did the system and the elites throughout these different plagues and stuff in different areas, how did they respond? Is there any similarities to like the modern day system? Um, obviously, that was a, the real deal. And, and the, the modern thing is a little bit. Uh, well, OK, so there's uh, the system. You know, the elites are caught into this as much as the poor people are. They are just as terrified as the poor people. They just have better means of escaping it. Right. Now, what resulted, the bubonic plague is, by some historians, and perhaps rightly so, credited with really booting up modernity because it increased the price of labor and it made laborers temporarily more valuable than they had been because it really reduced the labor force and kept the elites relatively intact because they had the better ability to isolate themselves than the poor people. They could afford firewood, for instance. They wouldn't have to huddle together under a blanket, okay? Um, and they could have somebody else go get the firewood and bring it in and then, and then leave and then go out in the field and die of the plague. But the, uh, the, uh, the end result is more social, uh, uh, more social control. You have uh, one of the first things that happens during the plague at the start of the Little Ice Age is that strangers that are coming into town are blamed for the plague and they're killed. And then you see a lot of rules, laws like the English poor laws are instituted primarily to limit travel and to make travel illegal unless you are given uh, freedom papers or a type of pass. And this is uh, one of the things that happened in the early modern period, recovering from the plague, because the plague is bad all the way through the Thirty Years' War uh, up to 1648, and then it hits England in the 1660s. Okay, So 
And this is something that initially took out two thirds of the European population. It was a huge thing. So the price of labor goes up and social control goes up. And eventually there's a correction of the price of labor once social control has been enhanced. <coughs> Excuse me, that's downstream. That's 200 years later, 300 years later with uh, the peasant revolts in England, for instance, and the war of the poor and Wat Tyler's Rebellion in England. So the War of the Poor and Wat Tyler's Rebellion, late 1300s, okay? Uh, the, the War of the Poor is over in Germany. The, uh, uh, and then the peasant revolts, which were, they were of peasants, and peasants were not servants. Peasants were free people who owned slaves. But see, peasants were the poorest people that got taxed, and they had obligations. And they were they were taxed more than their betters and they actually bore arms and they had servants. So peasants, when peasants revolted, that was a big deal because they could field a reliable infantry force. This is this is where you got your pikemen from. Servants and slaves did not make good close order infantry. They would be used as skirmishers and knife men and and swordsmen and swingers and, and stuff like that. A peasant and England might be a longbowman also, okay, a yeoman. So the peasants in, uh, in England were a big force to be reckoned with. So when they revolted largely over ethnic concerns and church prayer book doctrine is, is, what, is what happened here. At that point, the increased methods of social control that were uh, starting to be initiated in the English poor walls uh, came into play in helping support to suppress the peasant revolt and were then strengthened, okay, to help keep the lower class under the peasants down. Once the peasants were suppressed, they were included into the power structure uh, with the lower nobility. Some of them went up into the lower nobility. And then the poor walls focused on limiting the mobility of the workforce that uh, that the peasants and the lords both utilized and also limiting access to common land on the part of the poor. So the lower nobility and the peasants started walling off land and enclosing it in the enclosure acts at the same time that the people that were poorer than the peasants, because the peasants weren't poor. The, poor, the peasants were just the poor of the people in the power structure. They were the poorest of those. Real quick, who below would you, royalty, below the clergy, below the nobility. What would you... Free. Who would be a peasant in modern middle class class. so like you know like a a fireman or or cop or doctor okay yeah so these would be uh, okay well actually those are the inheritors of that social class okay but economically the person that would be a peasant today yeah is one somebody who has no debt okay they own property they have no debt and they own property they and they also have their own source of production. So this would be your small business owner that has enough liquid assets to today go out of business and discharge all of his obligations. So this is a rare person. This isn't most of the people who have inherited the peasant political attitude are actually, you name government employees. Well, they're just servant class people by medieval and early modern standards. They don't own land, they are not debt free, and they don't own a source of production. So the actual peasant class of today is generally going to be your upper middle class. I mean, your your middle class that has no debt, owns a source of production, okay, and owns property. And if they don't own a source of production, they have enough intellectual capital through being like, let's say, an accredited academic, or a politician, that they have an intellectual source of production. And that would represent your intellectual class of that early modern, late medieval period. Would it represent your alchemists, your, your people in the colleges, your clergy, your medical people who are not employees of a medical system and own their own source of production, like a friend of mine who built his own surgical center. He would be of the peasant academic class you know he would be the academic class the academic end of that continuum where where these people were free but the doctor today who's got debt to a university and has an obligation to work for a a medical corporation he would just be like a servant a physician 
in that period. So when we think of peasants in medieval times, we're thinking of successful business owners. Right. Now, do you think there were more peasants per capita, per population in the medieval era or in, um, in our era? era? Uh, well, it, what I just sketched out, the fact that the analog for the medieval peasant is actually a, a liquid modern businessman, a modern business person that has liquidity, owns property, debt free, okay, source of production. That's a small slice of the pie. And I don't know how big that slice is in either era, but it is not a majority. Right. The vast majority are serfs and slaves, 90%. In, in Russia, it's going to be 98% are serfs and slaves. They even had a Bureau of Slavery in Russia. In Germany, it's going to be a higher percentage. It's going to be in England. And, and uh, in France, it's going to be a higher percentage in England. And I don't know what the numbers are, but you're talking small minorities. OK, the unfree class, which is a serf or a slave or a maid. OK, 50 different designations, bondman. All of these people are in the early modern era and in the late medieval era are going to make up the majority over 50 percent of the population in any nation in Europe. OK. And in North America, in the plantations as well. But it's going to it's going to vary from from century to century from age to age, from decade to decade, and it's going to vary from nation to nation. Okay, so it's not something I can make a blanket uh, statement on. But if you look at the fact that prior to, uh, prior to the late 1800s, a person that was in debt would be bound in a poorhouse or a workhouse or on a plantation to satisfy that debt and become unfree, how many people do you know are debt free? OK. Um, OK. So everybody, you know, that's debt free, they would be free people in medieval times. Everybody, you know, that's in debt, credit card debt, mortgage, whatever, they would be unfree. They would be a serf or a servant, a bond man, a bond woman, a maid in medieval times. That's right. the way it would be. And myself, even though I'm not in debt, I would be regarded as an outlaw because I don't have a master. And right. I do not own property and I do not own people. I do not own a source of production and I am not part of an accredited uh, academy where I'm allowed to travel. I'm not uh, a minstrel or poet that is patronized by a lord or a king. OK, I would be like uh, I guess I'm a poet or a minstrel in medieval terms. I would be the one that would be telling stories and bringing news to the outlaws and vagabonds that lived in the woods. I wouldn't even be allowed in the village. I'd end up getting shackled uh, in the stocks and whipped at the pillory post and then sold to somebody as a servant. Yeah. Well, this makes me really want to get your book <laughs> about the hypothetical with you and your friend. Uh, uh, I forget his oh, name. Oh, Cox and Swain. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. yeah it, so, so the point is, is that not every serf and not every slave is going to be miserable because it was the common lot of mankind at that time. The lot of the slave uh, uh, varies depending on his position in the society and what society he is stuck in. In ancient Rome and in plantation America, it was generally pretty miserable. But if you are the slave of a well-heeled lady, OK, in medieval England, you're probably treated pretty well until plague hits town and then you're left to die. While while your mistress and her husband and her favorite maid go out to the countryside to ride out the plague. Right. And also it was one of the worst plagues in history was the plague that killed Pericles and sickened oh, Thucydides, who documents the plague. One whole chapter in his book is essentially devoted to his experience surviving this plague, which uh, medical historians disagree on what it was. And I'm not in a position to. Uh, to debate it. There was a high fever, respiratory dis distress, even dementia. It seems to have come from Egypt and it was first noticed amongst the slave traders. So you may well be talking about something that came up from Ethiopia or came up the Red Sea from India, which is a traditional source of plague in the old Mediterranean is India. India is a great source of the plague and uh, it did not spare the master or the slave. It was a terrible plague that seems to have 
killed one third of the Athenian population. And they suffered so badly because they were besieged and they were living behind walls. And guess what? Apollo is credited for afflicting them with the plague because right before the Athenians backed the rebel faction in Corsaira, which is modern Corfu, and we discussed this, uh, against the oligarchy, they backed the Democrats against the oligarchs, and the oligarchs were backed by Corinth, the, uh, the, uh, a member of the Delian League, okay, which became the Athenian League, was Delos. The Athenians committed the genocide of Delos. They killed every man of Delos. This was the second most sacred spot for Apollo. It was the island of Delos. They killed every man. They sold every woman and child. They even took the corpses of the priests of Apollo and they threw them out to sea and they desecrated the shrine of Apollo. Wow. And guess what? The, uh, uh, the Pythias, the Pythia, the girl, the, the drunken girl that's sniffing gas over that volcanic fissure up in the Delphic sanctuary of Apollo at Pythia, she, uh, when, when the Spartans don't want to go to war with the Athenians and they go to the Pythia to ask her, she recommends war with the Athenians because they have, they have committed blasphemy against the shining God. And she was the oracle of the shining God. Uh, so is it just coincidence or is there a real Apollo? I'm inclined to think that there's an actual Apollo. Uh, well, that's so true. everybody else is going to think it's a, it, it's a coincidence. Well, maybe we could go into a more theological, um, supernatural aspect of disease because I do, I've read some of your ideas and they're very interesting. And it seems, I mean, both, both pagans and Christians, and I don't know about Muslims, but have attributed disease to the wrath of, the, of God or gods. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's one of the, uh, if, you, if you read Ovid, uh, people uh, are afflicted by terrible diseases that are brought by various gods. There are more gods that bring diseases than help people who are smitten by disease. And, it, you know, it's a it, it's a field of suffering. Uh, the human continuum is uh, in, in the works of uh, Ovid. And it would come back and hit the Romans uh, 200 years after Ovid wrote. And it would it seems to have had something to do with them opening trade with China and India. There there was an actual Chinese slave uh, that escaped along. He was a slave commander of the most distant outpost of China in Central Asia, not far from Samarkand. He defected to uh, he, he defected to the Parthians, I believe, and then went over to the Armenians. And when the Parthians were unseated by the Sassanid Persians, uh, he was still uh, he was still like an advisor. He was this gigantic Chinese guy that was a great warrior. He was still an advisor to the Armenian king, who was a rebel king. You know, so that and there's uh, Ovid twice discusses how tigers hunt people on the banks of the Ganges River in India. You know, the, so there was, uh, and this was around the time of Christ. So Romans knew a lot about India. And they knew about China and they had direct contact with Chinese merchants. Well, so this is a and also the Romans did not have antibiotics. And uh, so a bacterial infection, something like uh, uh, cholera could really hit them hard because they had a very good water system. And this would cause a conduit for really a disastrous bacterial infection, which was killing lots of people in London up until the 1800s. Okay. Why did um, a lot of disease come from India? Was it like the jungle environment? It's, it's, an, incu it's an incubation zone because you have uh, – it, it's warm enough to have year-round agriculture, and then you also get the, the yummy tropical diseases. And some of these tropical diseases will jump to people, and then sometimes people will be able to transmit that to people in other environments. Okay. Do you think um – H uh, AIDS, HIV really came from monkeys or is it the wrath of the gods to the sodomites? <laughs> so. Oh, uh, OK. I think because they found HIV strands in COVID, I think it's part of the same United States, United Nations biological weapons program. 
Okay. And these people think of themselves as gods. So, yeah, it came from the gods. Uh, <laughs> I think they experimented on chimps first, and then the chimps got out and, you know, bit people or whatever happened. I definitely think I, I never thought this before. I didn't believe it. A lot of black guys told me that they believed this, that like white white scientists in Africa were experimenting on chips and blacks and put this disease out there. I never believed it. But since COVID was obviously made in the lab and it was there was HIV strands in it and the solution that they already had for it was HIV therapy medication that they passed off as a vaccine. Uh, then I think it's all part of the same maybe 60 year long bioweapon program that we're not done with yet. You know, uh, I mean, we're we're, we just got a breather right now because Dr. Evil's behaving badly over there and you got grain, you know, (laughs) so we got a little bit of a reprieve. But do keep in mind that with the war in the Sudan, the U.N. puts out news that there is a bioweapons lab that's been compromised in the Sudan. Okay. Well, they didn't say it was a bioweapons lab, but it's obviously a bioweapons lab. I see. Okay. Now, do you think some of these di- these diseases from the gods, you know, uh, like AIDS or the the Brovid, or they're gonna? I think I think the answer is yes. Uh, do they affect certain certain ethnicities more than others? Do you think? Th- I think I've read that from you, or maybe someone else. Oh well, the, the look. I, I spent a month living in New Jersey, listening to Mayor of New York give a a COVID briefing every day. And every day he would talk about how it affects Africans, Americans more than other people. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the propaganda. You know, uh, it looks like most of the people died of that disease, which was intentionally introduced uh, by the people that made it, died primarily from medical neglect, medical neglect that was used to generate a body count that was used to sell the treatment that was, that, existed before the disease was manufactured so it could just be a money grift but on one level it is but it's probably other things too Um, i I think some i think the um the magic potion in different countries um might be less harmful it's just a suspicion uh like because like take like russia and the like the middle kingdom they um they have like a demographic nightmare so i i just i suspect that they're their stuff might be less harmful because they want to increase their population, right? But like the Western elites, they want depop. So oh, yeah, I, they definitely want to kill Arabs. Right? <laughs> so I mean, I would too if I was like, you know, <laughs> if I was Brill Yates, I'd want me dead. I'd already send somebody to whack me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the uh, uh, the um, war. You know, it's war is a prime conduit of migration and disease. The migration and disease go together. High levels of population density, of course, makes it worse. And uh, efficient transportation infrastructure, again, makes it worse. The man who wrote Plagues and Peoples posited that what retarded the development of civilization in tropical zones was disease, was that the microparasites, uh, primarily mosquito-borne infections uh, made such dense populations more hazardous than they were in the temperate zone. And indeed, during cooling periods in the Roman period, one reason why Italy stopped becoming the population center is because when things got cooler, they had swampier conditions and they started to get malaria in Italy. And there has been malaria in the United States. Is a uh, the president of the Confeder- Confederacy, uh, Jefferson Daisy, Davis, his wife died of malaria. Oh, wow. Okay, so in relatively recent history. But the the Panama Canal could not be built until scarlet fever and malaria were addressed. Okay, it, it was one of the most heroic industrial undertakings of the modern age. And there's like a 900-page book I read on it. It's a fantastic book. Uh, Stevens was the head engineer. I forget the title of the book. He gave a talk to a bunch of young engineers after the Panama Canal was built, and he was the bell of the ball. He was the most famous engineer in the world. And he said, we are but children playing with pebbles on the shore of the great ocean. Okay, um, But th- the only reason why they even got that thing built uh, was because they were able to tackle yellow fever and malaria t- to get a workforce down there. So 
uh, Mac Noir, I think was the name of the guy that wrote Plagues and Peoples. He posited that the microparasites keep away the macroparasites, which is the government, that you can't have a big oppressive oh, that's a state in a place in the tropics where you have these type of uh, density adverse diseases that, that, that really have that kind that everybody's going to get it. Uh, when you're around a bunch of stagnant water and it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a real dense population you need to spread out a little bit you know so i uh, that that was his theory i don't know if i share it i just put it out there because he probably wrote, wrote what's still the best book of the history of this okay that's really interesting it's really interesting um what do you think because we're we're moving into a new mini uh ice age right or cold we're, we're getting temperatures are getting colder well, it seems like it. You know, we we had a real in the east here. I talked to people. You know, they didn't get any snow out here, but uh, two weeks ago it was snowing in Pittsburgh where I was. Uh, the nights are still always cool, no matter how the day is. So yes, the North America is cooling down. There was still five feet of snow in the uh, Sierras when I took the train through there. There are, as we speak in May, there are still lakes in the Rocky Mountains that are frozen solid. My friend Bob got 300 inches of snow. So they're already experiencing flooding and they still have frozen lakes. So uh, what generally happens with a cooling period, it takes a long time. More rain than usual leads to cooler temperatures, which means more snow than usual in some spots, which means increase in formation of glaciers and lengthening of the winter and shortening of the summer. And it's a slow process that has to do with the fact that the sun goes into a quieter cycle. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have some years here in the next 30 years where there's going to be no sunspot activity. You know, so it's just going to be cooler in the northern hemisphere and uh, it might just be a 30 year dip. But we're due for another 500 year dip. You know, we went from the 290s when the Little Ice Age started to the 840s when it ended, the 1840s, that's the, sorry, the 1290s to the 1840s. What's that? That That's like 550 years, I think. The peak of it was really 1320 to 1816. That was because the big nasty event, the deluge, is, is 1215 to 1221. And the last real nasty event is the year without a summer, uh, which is 1816. And then it tapers off. There were a bunch of North Atlantic storms that wiped out whole cities in the 1290s. At wow. 1300, you had Inuits showing up in kayaks in Scotland. Okay. <laughs> right? wow. That, wow. So, and then you got, uh, and then in 1816, on the other end of it, you've got a year without a summer. Okay. So then you go through a warming trend from 1820 to, uh, uh, 2017. Okay. And the warming at the tail end, warming lessened or became stagnant around 2005. That's when the, when the ocean buoy temperatures stopped going, going up. It was like 2005. You got an anomalously warm year in 2016. Then it goes down from there. And then you get a big cool spike starting about 2019. You get unusual amounts of rain in the mid-Atlantic in the winter, you get these warm northwest summers, unusually warm in the Pacific Northwest, and then you start to get early snows, late snows, late thaws in the Rocky Mountains, and then you got what we had in the Pacific Northwest this year, where we were 10 degrees below normal temps for a couple of months, and then it, you got records, record amounts of snow in Oregon uh, this year, and Never, never before seen snow amounts in California and the Rockies. Rockies got snow that has never been seen since Europeans settled it. So this might be a, it might be an anomaly, or if uh, this continues, it might be the beginning of another little ice age. At the very least, it's the beginning of a 30-year cooling cycle, and these cooling cycles are always combined with more moisture which tends to increase pollen production and my doctor back here has noted over the past five years that there has been increased moisture and pollen production in the chesapeake bay region which is causing 
his patients to start to get bronchitis based on allergy, which wasn't something he saw a lot 10 years ago. So th these types of things can make you more susceptible to disease. And if something happens with a supply chain, for instance, if somebody buys up a bunch of agricultural land and puts it out of production, or if infrastructure breaks down, if gas prices go up, uh, if truck traffic because of gas prices is diverted to rail, and then the rail infrastructure doesn't hold up, then all of these things could could cause an artificial famine. I mean, speaking of a famine in a place like the United States is just ridiculous. This entire country is like a Roman banquet of the senatorial class every day. The poorest people in this country eat better than the emperor of Rome ever did. Okay. okay so, uh, but we have a pretty large population of people who might be fat, but they're nutritionally malnourished because they have like these, you know, low nutrition diets. And th these are a lot of the people that died during the shamdemic. A lot of poor people died because they couldn't get antibiotics for bronchitis and pneumonia okay. or because they got a tube jammed down their throat and blew out their lungs. Right. You know, so, yeah, we're probably looking at more all cause death and more chronic illness. And then we're not going to get a plague until it's been decided that we're going to get a plague. And it's probably going to be a factory made plague. But uh, these people are tempting the gods because we might get a real plague with all the uh, fooling around they're doing with uh, with their plagues and their cures. You might get the real deal. Right. Um, so, I mean, they're trying to manufacture one because they want to reduce the population. Right? Uh, well, I also think that they're afraid of the real plague. And they're also trying to use the mass of the people on the planet as a gigantic clinical study. Yes, that will cause some fatalities that will reduce, that it will at least, it will at least eliminate population growth. It might not reduce the population, but they're, number one, they're worried about population growth. I think they got it dialed in now. I think they've already stopped the population growth. So this is a win-win-win for the elites. They've stopped the population growth, it seems. Uh, the other thing, they're really worried about their own health. They want to live forever. So not only do they want to afflict us with diseases so that they can experiment on us with miracle cures, they want to actually develop a real miracle cure, which only they will have, which will allow them to ride out the disease that they either manufacture once they know they've got the cure and they're the only ones that have the cure or the disease that comes out of nowhere, that comes out of nature. That's the one they're really worried about. OK, that they uh, they uh, they're looking for the fountain of youth and uh, they're scared to death because to them, death is eternal. That for them, the only eternity is to live forever or to get their consciousness uploaded into a computer. All right. I mean, this is what these people are. So uh, I think they really uh, they're primarily concerned about themselves medically being healthy. So they're they know all the best science fiction writers now work for think tanks that work for these fuckers. OK, <laughs> right. they knew this was coming. They did the whole global warming thing to get us looking right when the world was going left. OK, because they knew things were going to cool down. It was going to cause problems, going to cause health problems. Food production problems. I tell you what, when Canada and Russia go out of food production, that's going to be a big deal. OK, so that's why you're going to see a struggle for the Sahel, because that's going to go back into large scale food production when this happens. That's why you're going to see the chinks and the Russians and the Americans in Africa. Now, the uh, uh, the the concern is for these people and their minority elite group to live longer, healthier lives. So. They're more concerned about using us as guinea pigs that might accidentally die in their in their planet wide clinical study than they are with killing us. OK, because eventually something's going to hit that is going to kill us because the population density and uh, because they've managed to falsify medicine and weaponize it. So if a real plague hits, they're going to do something that's going to make that worse. They might have already done it by injecting a lot of people with these spike proteins. They might have already set most of us up for for being an easy mark for the next natural plague that comes up. The next thing that does come out is the southern Chinese avian or swine population. They might have already scored that. Right. Um, when do you think that might happen? Well, I, I've, I have no idea, but I know what they're concerned with. They're really concerned 
with what might naturally come out of southern China. Okay. And they did a test run of their own shit coming out of southern China as a way of tracking this and then used it to get emergency indemnified authorization to experiment on us with a cure for the real thing that they're afraid it's going to come down the pipe. And now as a side benefit, the fact that this cure that apparently doesn't work, it looks like it sets people up to get res- to catch respiratory stuff forever. OK, at an acute level, at a severe level, at a mild level, whatever. Uh, so that does the service of setting up the entire population to get called by something natural or something man-made that comes later. OK. You know, and, but ultimately, they're still going to look for a real cure. But if they get the real cure, we're not going to see it. It's going to be for them. Maybe they already got it. Maybe they already got the information they needed to come up with a real cure or a real preventative. Maybe they just rediscovered how important ivermectin was, and they're going to use that. <laughs> what was, what'd you just? What'd you say? Ivermectin? Ivermectin. Maybe I, I've got it. I got the horse wormer paste. You know, maybe they just rediscovered that. Hey, yeah, ivermectin is really the best thing to fight off a virus. You know? Uh, yeah. Okay. And we'll tell everybody else it doesn't work. <laughs> And we'll just make sure we're the only ones that have that when the real shit hits, <laughs> you know, okay. but it's it, the ultimate plan is going to be to have a, the elites want an ancient population. They want a population of under a billion people planet wide. They want entire continents that are going to be natural theme park where they just have a couple of hotels and airports where they can go and experience nature. And then they'll probably have some like robots or something like. And well, they'll they'll have us. They'll, they'll have some. They'll have people. Well, yeah. I mean, they'll have they'll have robots. They'll have all kinds of weird shit. But ultimately, they're going to want servants that they can fuck. Right. 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 And that they can kill. And that they can crossbreed with. So read the full book of Enoch. Okay. <laughs> you know, these well, people think that they're that they're the watchers. And, you know, guess what? They set themselves up a surveillance state. Um, yeah, the book of, you know, I, mean, I haven't read it. I've just, like, seen little clips and stuff. That would be kind of interesting to talk about the Apocrypha and everything. Um, but I wanted to ask you about. I, I think things are looking good for these masterminds. I think Bro Yates has got things on track. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be better than the world he was looking at when when he came of age. OK, now, um, do you think, like, um, the Amish and these, like, European Christian um, agricultural like communities that are kind of I don't want to call them a, a cult, but like, you know, um, they're secluded and they're usually European and they got like, a, at least from what I've seen online, they got some really fucking beautiful women. Do you think those are like little like genetic like the elites are allowing these people to exist? Because I always wonder why they the elites let them even exist. Yeah. Is it just just to save some genes save some blue-eyed white well, women they can, they can fuck later on it's a low-tech workforce you know if you get the future that they want where you have these small high-tech cities where you have everything you want in it uh and they they don't want to have any like heavy industry the amish are good to have around for a low-tech workforce so they're going to be the the slaves of the future and they do have attractive women and uh I'm sure, I hope that one of my grandsons in the future will get a job working for Brill Yates, abducting the most beautiful Amish women and bringing them to him. Okay. <laughs> right. So you mean like, we'll, so you mean like a low tech workforce? You mean like, okay, we want some people to make our like, um, they want our, our they, yogurt, our organic yogurt. Yeah. Or, yeah. These rich people, they okay, want grass fed right. beef. They don't want food pump full of hormones. Remember, they want to live forever. Right. Okay. You know, they they would like to see Amish style agriculture that they controlled. OK, it would be enough to feed them. OK, it wouldn't be enough to their slaves would, you know, eat like Star Trek food. OK, but they would be eating the stuff that the Amish produced in the countryside. Slaves wouldn't have access to that. Well, they'll let the Amish still eat it because they want to they want to. Well, yeah, because they got to produce it. Sure. OK. OK. Interesting. Yeah, you just leave them, let them produce. Let them multiply in certain areas that you don't want for to revert to pristine nature. And, you know, bam, go up and take your helicopter out and hunt some wild bison. After all those red states get eliminated and turn into, you know, bison national park. OK. And every rich guy can go kill a bison every year and stock his freezer. 
Right. Okay. You know, while his Pakistani auto mechanic is eating, you know, Vegemite and uh, textured soy protein, you know, that's. <laughs> right, right, right. So what do you think? I, what do you think America is going to be? Because like you have you have like the, the chinks are buying parts like all these foreigners are they're buying different parts. Is it going to be like you got the Amish and then you got hunting reserves? We're, we're already in a post national. Right. OK. The right. first time that you saw the United States advertise itself as the global policeman, as a force for good. That was the queer announcement of a post national world. <laughs> OK, so we're already in a corporate world where, yeah, you know, this, the governments just facilitate what corporations and NGOs want. OK, mm -hmm. there's, you know, and right. there's a bunch of these. There, there's like 150 really powerful NGOs. OK, so it's these things and corporations, you know, that's that's what runs the world. And banks, banks are part of that. And, uh, you know, it, it's we're well on the way to the world of rollerball and nobody sees it, which is good. That's what you want. OK, uh, you don't want that deer to know it's about to get shot. You don't want to spoil the taste of the meat. You want you want it to be a surprise. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, when they drink our blood, they want it to be a surprise. So they don't have that, you know, metallic panic taste in their blood. <laughs> all that cortisone it doesn't taste good. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we have about, I mean, 10 more minutes. Uh, I'm. Do you have any more stuff you'd like to add? I'm tr I'm trying to think of a good question for you, but I'm running out of questions. Well, the, keep in mind that uh, under bad urban conditions, it's happening in Haiti right now. The U.S. government had 14 Jamaican Americans. They all had dual citizenship. Kill the president of Haiti. Wow. Okay. Because he didn't want to vaccinate his people. This also produced a lot of Haitian refugees into the U.S., which is a net good for USG. Okay. And you have a, a very bad situation in Haiti right now where they've got a cholera ec epidemic going on. So cholera is shit water. OK, it's it's just a breakdown in your sewage system. The EPA has already had to take over the Sparrows Point sewage plant in Baltimore County, Maryland, where I was yesterday, just down the street from there. I take the bus right by the sewage plant. OK, that plant already failed. So. Just letting the water system for the mass of people go bad can just, within a week, get rid of most of your population. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, now typhus comes from uh, fleas, okay? You, it's a crowded military or squalor conditions, and you get bit by fleas. And if something's going to happen in cold environments, you're going to have a bunch of people like in places like uh, Eastern Europe getting hit with that. OK, with something like that. But the whole world is always waiting for cholera and dysentery. OK, it's not when you're congested and you're in an urban environment. You've got that. So that's the front line disease to worry about. It'll be very easy for the elites to secure ahead of time their own clean water source. OK, so but, you know, what do you do with uh, and, and the military? The, the military is very good at establishing its own clean water sources. And the military will be tasked for us with making sure that the ruling class, the House and the Senate, and depending on people and all of these people, that they're taken care of first. Right. So you want to, if you're worried about disease in the future, you know you're going to get hit with a respiratory thing. Whatever you learn about that, you know, use that. But uh, in a collapse situation, which the government doesn't have total control of because we could always get hit by the meteor. I was praying to the sweet meteor of death when I was answering that Fed's, uh, you know, uh, screech. <laughs> okay, you know. Uh, so, do you think there's that's happening? always a chance that there could be a disaster that's going to cause a big water problem, and it might not be fixable under if it happens in enough places at the same time. You know, you got a couple of federal fire teams and go put fires out. If it happens everywhere at the same time, then good luck. Well, do you think we've we've actually were hit by a meter in the past, like that killed the dinosaurs or? Oh, it looks like that was the one that if you look at a map of the Western Hemisphere, right above the Yucatan in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there is a big crater right there. OK. And there is a layer of iridium all around the world from that strike. Now, there was either a piece of a comet or a meteor hit the ice sheet that was over top of what is now the Great Lakes and probably formed 
the Great Lakes about 10, 11,000 years ago. That caused the Younger Dryas event, and it caused the extinction of most of the large mammals in North America and the extinction of most of the people in North America about 10, 11,000 years ago. Uh, there's a meteor that landed in the western United States 50,000 years ago that uh, caused some mass extinctions in the western United States. And the, the crater's famous. I forget what it's called. There was a chunk of rock still in the mid- middle of it. It was like a one-ton meteor that made this like five-mile wide, wide crater, which I think caused like forest fires all across the western U.S. 50,000 years ago. Wow. So the thing that happened 10, 11,000 years ago, uh, that apparently caused forest fires across the entire northern heaven and didn't just cause the mass extinction of most North American megafauna, oh. which is animals above 75 kilos or I think 100 and 150 pounds. Uh, it caused the extinction of numerous species of, uh, you know, ice age animals like giant sloths and uh, mammoths and mastodons in Europe as well. Okay. Because they were not wiped out by a handful of Paleolithic hunters with sharp sticks. <laughs> right. But yeah, it, it's a, it's interesting stuff. I, I I like discussing those types of things. But I uh, I think that uh, we're on course for inc- increased social control. And by hook or crook, when when you get a disease, the disease that killed Valerian, who was a, a pretty good emperor. There were a number of emperors. The inv- Emperors at the end of the 200s AD were increasingly soldiers from the frontier. It'd be like Daniel Boone or Davy Crackett coming back to Washington and becoming president, okay? Because nobody trusted the rich guys at home to do anything anymore, okay? So it would be like one of our generals or admirals coming back from overseas and taking over the United States and trying to fix things up. Well, these efforts by these various generals become emperors, uh, they might have some short-term success against the barbarians, but eventually they would get their throats cut by the politicians and soldiers at home. Uh, and there were plagues and diseases that came with these bar- barbarian invasions, like when the Goths invaded uh, Dacia, uh, there was a plague at that period. After plagues and these types of migratory disasters, when you get new groups of people coming into uh, a place that that unarmed people, you understand most of the people in most of the provinces of the Roman Empire never had any type of weaponry. They were non-combatant people. The only people with weapons, even the senators didn't have weapons. The only people with weapons were the soldiers, the guards, the police, and the gladiators who were entertainers. Imagine that, a world where only the police, the army, and actors had weapons. Okay. Now The senators if- didn't have those like small little knives no that's not a weapon it's like a pistol it's not a weapon it's not a military significant weapon okay so yeah a a slave's going to have a stick or a sickle or whatever he's not going to have armor sword you know military grade weapons good luck taking a dagger against a guy with a spear and a shield and a sword you know you're just me okay so the uh uh you know so the roman dagger that the senators had that they stabbed julius caesar with it's the modern equivalent of your your Vicodin that you're going to OD on and commit suicide on or use to murder your husband. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's not a weapon. It's not a military-grade weapon. Right. So you had a world where only actors, police, and the army had weapons. Yeah. So then when you get a migration of people into that place, you have a great disruption, and then you get a reorganized social system. I'm a, tomorrow I plan on writing an article on what things – have changed massively in America in the past three years, accompanied by disease, okay? Real, imagined, manufactured, whatever. Whatever, you know, the story is we got hit by a big disease. Was it a mass delusion and medical neglect? Was it an organic disease? Was it a factory-made disease? Was it by accident? Was it on purpose? Doesn't matter. The mass mind feels it's been hit by disease, and it has permitted itself to be remolded in a new image. The American mass mind has done a 180 including the NFL, on a lot of things. And the NFL is the beating heart of the United States. I hate it. I've never liked the NFL, but it's the beating heart of the United States. And that did a 180. In what, in what regard? Because I've never, I've hardly ever watched that. Okay, so, I don't really okay, so the that. NFL, three years ago, this, this loser quarterback that can't win a game anymore decides to kneel and calls a big white guilt stake. Oh, right. This mixed race guy. The NFL's not having that shit. He's gone. A year later, 
a year later, you better kneel or you're out of the NFL. <laughs> you better kneel. You, you go from advertising pickup trucks to advertising military recruitment. Okay. You go from uh, suspending a U.S. combat veteran for not kneeling to having all the men on your sidelines and women on your sidelines dress up in military fatigues in honor of the troops. You know, I, I mean, come on, you, you go from uh, you go from rednecks to black chicks. Right. You know, I mean, it's just it's a 180 and it's a beating heart of America. That's just one of many things, you know. So this is what the reforms of Diocletian did. Diocletian successfully reformed the Roman Empire and actually peacefully retired was not assassinated. OK, he was only really able to do this after a combination of barbarian invasions and disease hit the Roman Empire. Interesting. OK. OK, see, because a disease is something. These are two existential things. But you know what? They're hairy barbarians, but they're still people. We know they're people. We can kill them. We can have sex with them. OK, we can enslave them. All right. They can rob us. They can murder us. They're people. OK, but the disease, you know, that comes from beyond. That comes from beyond human understanding. The modern understanding is it comes from within the microsphere. OK, well, well what were the Diocletian? What did he change? Uh, well, that would have to be. OK, OK, OK. But, you know, but is there any like, one one of social reform? Uh, yeah, it was just, you know. It, I'm just it's curious, a good story. It's instructive, but yeah, it's a big stuff. Is there just like one or two tidbits that are w- what's happened currently after Brovid? With oh yeah, that- uh, okay. okay. Uh, defund the police has gone to the total rebranding of the Baltimore City Police Department. A a force for good service, doing good. And what they want is they want black women as police officers. Okay, so here's one. If you talk about anything that's twice as common as it used to be, overnight, twice as common, armed private security is four times as prevalent nationwide as it was in 2019. Four times. 400 percent. That's a big deal. That's just one. You know, that's just one thing. And they all track with this. Nobody wore masks in 2019 ever. We were fighting a war in Afghanistan to keep people from having to wear masks. Right now. Today, this week, when I go outside, I'm going to run into people on the street wearing masks. It's not going to be a lot of them, but I'm never going to go anywhere where I don't see somebody wearing a mask. It's ever present. It was nothing. How do you even qualify that? That's from zero to a million. I mean, it's just like that's a sea change right there. Um, You know, this is just uh, the way mass transit is. There's been many significant changes in mass transit from 2019 to nine to, to now, three years later many significant changes, you know, so I, I'm going to sit down and collate them all. It was a lot of them. I was meditating on it when I, and a lot of them are mass transit and law enforcement because I'm making observations on the bus and on the train as I'm traveling around. One of them is medical uh, security. Private security has doubled at medical facilities. It has not doubled as much as it is overall, but uh, you now have more than just a security guard. You have a law enforcement presence at medical facilities. There are entire private security corporations that cut their teeth and built their bones during COVID supervising masking and vaccination and facility access. There's one in Pennsylvania. I ran into a heavily armed private cop. He's not a cop. He's a security guy. And he works for this company and his whole kit, his $5,000 worth of gear, that that's all off the back of COVID. Now, if these private, I mean, I'm sure they have already had but when they, you know, shoot people and stuff like that, they had the full – will they have the full backing of the state or are they going to get – They've done better than municipal police. Private security has gotten in less trouble for killing people than municipal police. And they're also involved in human trafficking. Not all of them, but this one company in Pennsylvania also has a human trafficking sideline. Okay. And um, it's also somewhat related. Uh, I was wa- I was listening to that, um, that Texas – like cop um, who ended up going to prison and he was talking about um, he just like briefly said it for a few seconds. I, I sent the video to you on Skype, but uh, he um, he says that in Texas now, most of the prison guards are from Africa. I don't remember which African country, but um, and he was talking about how effing like fucking brutal. They it's are. probably Nigerians and, and Ghana boys. Now I can tell you that in the Pacific Northwest, 
And in the Mid-Atlantic, a high percentage of your private security people that are guards and not paramilitaries are African. The guy that's just there with, you know, a club and a taser, you know, to make sure you you don't come in the building if you're not supposed to. He tends to be African. The guys with the AR-15s and the body armor, they tend to be uh, Caucasian and Puerto Rican. Okay, yeah, because ex-military. It's what ex-military guys. Okay. You know, so it splits. And prison guards would would fit with that private security guy, the guy with a club, you know, the meat shield guy, you know, that's not armed with the firearm. Right. Okay. And that's um that's intentional, right? Like they don't. Is it just because they're they're well, they don't, it's they don't just, have the skills to? to I don't care? know how it's, I don't know how intentional this is, but you got look if if you're running a private security outfit. And you're going to get twenty dollars an hour for the guy watching the door at the train station, and you're going to get a hundred dollars an hour for your goon with the AR-15 at the gas station. Well, anybody can be the guy at the door at the train station. So you get somebody that's coming from a country that doesn't make any money, that's masculine, that'll stand up and bar the door, okay? But you're not going to give him an AR-15 and send him to Blackwater to get trained when you've already got guys that have been. Uh, that have been killing men in Afghanistan and Iraq for the past 20 years, right. chopping at the bit to get that $100 an hour. It just makes sense. It's just economics. You want right. people to have the skills. Again, it's that thing where people think that, well, you know, only a certain race can do this or a certain race can do that. But it's just who's got the skills? The guys that go in the military to get those skills are guys that already have shooting skills when they're a child. OK, or they're hyper aggressive guys that want to get in combat like Puerto Ricans. Generally, the guys would already shoot, already have shooting skills. They're rural Caucasian guys. They go into the military. What are they going to do when they get out of the military? Nobody wants them anywhere else because they're they're not a, a diversity hire. So you go where people want function. They want high function, paramilitary, you know, fully armed security, private army. Okay. That's where the guy goes. The guy's got the skills for that, you know. Uh, but if you're looking at Americans with no military experience that are going to be reliable combatants without a weapon they're going to be willing to fight some tweaker well you're not going to find any americans to do that because americans are sissies so you go to a real country like nigeria where they have real men okay who will fight okay and you bring them over right okay you know and it also serves the purpose of having somebody of another nationality policing your people because you never want to have empathy on the part of the police this is why we've got Nigerian and Turkish and Chinese national cops in New York City and in Baltimore City right now. Yeah, that's crazy. National. I mean, these people at best have dual citizenship. Right. OK, but that is the same as policing has been in every country throughout history. Right. Going back to the Athenian archers, right? Right. Right. Yeah. The, 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 the Scythian archers who, archers who the Athenians hated. Those 300 guys were there to oversee the uh, 10,000 to 15,000 free unarmed Athenians. The only Athenian that was allowed to bear arms in Athens was the guy that was on the wall looking out. And for every one of him, there was a Scythian archer there to shoot him in the back if he got out of line. Okay? So it's the same as it ever was. You want police from the outside. Was there any ever any um, conflicts, organized conflicts, between the hopolite, Athenian hopolites and the Scythian archers. Only history. in my novel, Beyond the Sunset Veil. Vale. Okay. 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 And it was very small scale. Okay. Uh, Behind the Sunset Veil vale was the story of Aristotle trying to run away from the Athenian assassins and people from the future trying to help him out. Because we know if he goes to Eobia that he's going to be poisoned by Athenian agents. There. So okay. he tries to make it into the hinterland with some help. So, so it is. But the only records of the Scythians in combat is them actually acting as skirmishers alongside the hoplites. It's not like they had to shoot the Athenians and kill them. OK, you know, they it, you know, this was a real society. If the other Athenians said, we find you guilty, you need to die. You'll kill yourself. They don't need to have the Scythians. But just in case a rival politician wanted to try or some oligarchs or some old monarchists tried to rise up against, uh, you know, against the democracy. That's why the Scythians were there. They weren't there against other Democrats. They were in case the oligarchs or the uh, 
or the old monarchists tried to reestablish themselves and get some other Athenians behind them. Because it was an age of, re- of political revolution internal to homogeneous ethnic communities. So it was very, it was very nasty, but it's also very honor based. Socrates poisoned himself. He'd rather die a heretic in Athens at his own hand, surrounded by his friends, than die in exile. He could have just left. Right. So you so, normally did not need these police. The, the prime thing that the Scythian police would have done would have been capture and kill runaway slaves who weren't Athenian. Because nine out of ten people that lived in Athens weren't Athenians. They were slaves. Okay. Okay. So it's just like, you know, the Romans. You know, there's, the new emperor comes in. You surrender to him. You're the old emperor. And the emperor says, I'm going to show you mercy. And then the cement, and then he comes back in and says, well, the Senate has voted like, you know, 499 to one. Uh you know, that you need to die. So uh, we already killed that one guy. <laughs> and now you need to kill yourself or we're going to have the Praetorian Guards do it. What is it? So he'll, you know, so I'll say, well, you know, I'll, uh, I'll let my slaves open my veins and I'll die that way. Okay. Okay. It, you know, so this was the type of, it wasn't the type of revolution, revolutionary stuff uh, that, that we think of. Okay. But, you know, because the people still had an ethnic identity, which we do not have. Because we're post-ethnic. We're this macro-racial people that suppose supposedly the absence of color because that's what white is <laughs> right. I, I still i still haven't found a paper towel that's as dark as i am I, i'm looking i'm holding my hand up to a paper towel and a white end table right now and i'm not seeing the slightest resemblance I'm right just, you know i'm just closer to that table tone than the next guy well you it was either you or E. Michael Jones. I can't remember. Well, maybe it was still you, and he he stole he copied from you. But you were one of you guys said something like the ancient way uh, to determine um, ethnicity was something like eye color and hair color. Oh yeah, well that was the the, the and class part, was skin color, right? The, Not ethnicity. The the Greek speaking Romans referred to the Germans, the Scythians, the Sarmatians in the gales as the fair haired racist. If uh, you were William Wallace and you had a buddy whose name was Douglas the Black, that meant that Douglas had black hair, which made him kind of an anomaly, which meant that maybe Douglas's daddy went down to Morocco and abducted himself a slave girl. Who knows? Okay. Or maybe Douglas's granddaddy bought a Persian slave girl with nice black hair. Okay. So to have black hair and be a European of Germanic, Nordic, uh, uh, or Gaelic stock was to be very odd. Okay. You know, so we, we totally lost that. You know, now that's, uh, it, it's just, it, it's gone. It's not coming back. Uh, you know, uh, people want to think of themselves as either the absence of color or the absence of white. <laughs> you know, so, so that's, that's a pretty deep metaphorical affliction right there. Right. And so, because black but, and white aren't colors. Right. Who ever started calling Chinese people yellow? Most of the ones I meet are whiter than me, and particularly the Japs. S- some of them are, I mean, especially the the northern um, Chinese, and then that would include the Japanese and the Koreans. Yeah, they're they're very white. Um, the southern ones, though, are are where it's hotter climate. Yeah, the Vietnamese uh, people, but even then, I don't see yellow. I mean, they're not yellow. <laughs> you know, it's like a it's a nicer tan than I can get. You know, it's kind of like it seems more related to Mediterranean olive skin. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. So we're just totally screwed as far as our perception of race goes. It's just ridiculous. So it's not worth discussing with Americans of a- any race. It's it just, uh, you know, it's just retarded. <laughs> well, so um, E. Michael Jones, he talks about like how you go like America used to have ethnic um, enclaves within cities. Right. You have like the Polish or the, the Irish. And then that that got was gotten rid of through social engineering. Sure. And um, then he says, now we just live in a place where it's like your um, your identity is tied to your religion. And that could even be like a re- you're an atheist. Right. So that's a religion, too. So like that's that's his theory. Um, I don't know. Uh, if you- most people don't have a re- most people I know in this country do not have an important religious identity. Okay. Their identity is economic. Yeah, the god of things. Most yeah. people define themselves by their job, by their profession, and most people do not identify. They'll let you know what religion they nominally belong to. 
but most people are not uh, metaphysically religious. They're economically re their religion is money, the thing that keeps them uh, from losing everything, from maintaining their debt stream. You know, so I would disagree with him on on it there, just because most. Maybe most people he knows are religious. Most people I know aren't religious. I live with fundamentalist Christians. I live with Mormons. They're religious. Hardly anybody else I know is re religious. Right. Almost, the only Catholic people I know who would describe themselves first and foremost as Catholics are guys that just became Catholic as an expression of their cultural descent and go to Latin Mass. Those are the only people I know. The first thing out of the mouth would be, I'm Catholic. And they just became Catholic. Yeah, I used to Mexican be. doesn't say he's Catholic first. He's Mexican first. Right. I, I used to be of that um, persuasion uh, with the Catholic Latin Mass. Oh, that's fine. I don't have anything against that. Yes, I, that's not, I, no, I wasn't implying you did. Um, but I was yeah, just, there's, it, it's just that a religious identity is so rare as to be regarded as weird in this country. Right. I've already had discussions with people about that. This lady just found out that the daycare operations run by a Christian. She's afraid they're going to religiously indoctrinate her child. And she's not a Christian, you know. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, probably half of Americans think that most children are molested due to a connection with a religious structure, that they're molested by a priest or a pastor or Sunday school teacher or something like that. That's what most Americans think. Okay. Yeah, you know, because most Americans are not religious. Right. I'm not saying that that stuff definitely, definitely happens. But I, I was told that this. That um, and I agree with you. Most people think that way, but I I heard and I haven't, I haven't looked at the statistics with my own eyes, but I was hearing from some Catholic apologists that you're actually like there's more instances of uh, child molestation in like the public schools or some or the oh, sure. or, or foster it's care, so secular. Yeah, it's not the religion. You know, like this lady said, how could you live with Mormons? All they do is molest children. <laughs> said, well, in fact, I've gone to a Mormon church. And a teacher is never allowed to be alone with a child. A teacher is not even allowed to be alone in a classroom of children. A parent has to be there as a chaperone. And they're never allowed to teach children of the other sex. Okay. okay so, so, no, it sounds a lot better in the public schools, doesn't it? Yeah, a lot better. There's no dating the teacher in that situation. Right. right. So, you know, but this is what, but this person has listened to podcasts about this kind you know, it, it's just it's whatever the media says, even if it's your own alternative media. You know, so the, it, it's just that, you know, to the extent Americans are religion, it's are religious. It's either invested in economics or medicine. It's either putting off eternity. OK, or living in the now. It, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, so well, glad to know somebody's out there is a bigger crackpot than me. If you think that most Americans uh, have a religion as a primary identity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, that was true. Uh, in his was true, defense, 150 years ago, wasn't even true 100 years ago. Well, in his defense, I think he he has a broader sense, a broader definition of religion. So, like, he would say those those people worshiping medicine or or money, they're a part of a, a religion. But well, yeah, yeah, they are. I agree. Okay, uh, but. You know, so if you look at it that way, but they don't believe they're part of a religion. True. They true. believe they're secular. Right. They don't understand how religious were. That's why he told me she's an atheist. She believes that means she's non-religious, but it actually means that she is a firm, fanatical believer in the most aggressive religious cult going right now, which is atheism. OK, well, uh, you, you know, but she can't know that. And the most um, most modern people never put it that way. Religion can only be what religion was for our ancestors. Religion can't be what we worship now. <laughs> right. Is that, yeah. And it's funny. I mean, I find this a lot with women. You know, they'll say like um, they're atheists or this or that, you know, or they don't believe in God or they're not religious or something. But then they'll talk about how they believe in all this like new age stuff. You know, <laughs> most Americans just worship black people. <laughs> OK, I mean, that's the predominant American religion is worshiping black people. Watch 20 commercials in a row on cable or network TV. Right. Say, OK, most Americans worship black people. That That's, you know, <laughs> so, so anyhow, I, you know, well, more power to E. Michael Jones. And uh, I'm gonna, my eyes starting to pop from talking this long. So I'm going to have to go. No, it, right. no problem. It was a pleasure as always, James. 
All right, man. Um, okay, I will put the the ending music on here. Oh. One second. Let me find out. Ah, yes.